Catechisms as a distinct literary genre were the product of the early modern reformations. In a concise and educationally appropriate form, they provided a broad leadership and a clear outline of the most important things a Christian must know in order to live and die with purpose and hope. Moreover, in the early stages of confessionalism, works of catechesis defined and molded confessional cultures by demarcating the boundaries between different understandings of the faith and between different societies. Given this theological and educational potential of the genre of catechisms, it comes as no surprise that leading Protestant reformers like Luther, Luther, and Calvin devoted their time and energy to the production of catechisms. Yet, the founding father of Reformed Protestantism, as we might, might say, was extremely did not replace the Reformed tradition with a similar text. Nevertheless, today I am pleased to present to you a paper on the seemingly contradictory themes of Zwingli and the Zurich catechetical tradition. I will explore the question to what extent Zwingli contributed to the development of this tradition, which is known primarily through Leo Lutz's German catechisms of 1534 and 35. A few preliminary remarks are in place. First, the concept of a catechetical tradition includes more than an enumeration of theological statements found in printed works of catechisms. It should also include, ideally, the didactical and ecclesiastical practices and expectations underlying printed works of catechism. The second remark concerns the state of scholarship. As far as I am aware, no detailed study of the catechetical tradition in Zurich has been undertaken since the seminal work by Salomon Hess back in 1811. Also, a critical edition of the major Zurich catechisms by Neil Jude has not been published yet. We have a modern day German translation by Oscar Farmer from the 1950s. Therefore, I will start my presentation today by an overview of three or four fixed points of the Zurich catechetical tradition. Since there is also a degree of unclarity surrounding some of these points, I have added a question mark behind fixed points, whereas they were not so very fixed. First, research literature regularly refers to Zwingli's 1523 educational treatise for Pacto in the Uni Adolescentis. Sentes for Mandisint. This, however, is hardly a work on catechesis, but rather a humanist style introduction for the Bildung of auspicious Christian youth in general. Second, and more relevant, is the so called Wall Catechism of 1525. You find a small uh, print of it on the handout. It bears the title Dies sind die Zien Gebot. This document is a single sheet folio size Froschauer print. Which the text of the Mosaic Law, its New Testament summaries, the Lord's Prayer, the Hill Mary, and the Creed are printed in the vernacular. It was intended to be attached to the walls of classrooms and family homes as an alternative focus point for devotion, replacement of the traditional representations of saints. Uh, in the nice exhibition at the Central Bibliothek, we find an example of a traditional saint's calendar, which was also attached to the walls of homes. So, uh, this is a, an alternative. This uh, 1525 wall catechism gives a specific and new translation of the Ten Commandments. I will return to this later. In April 1525, Tsungi identified Leo Wood as the author of this recent translation of the Ten Commandments. Therefore, it can be assumed that it was printed in early 1525 and that Jude was probably the author. A third fixed point is made up by the ordinances from 1532 concerning the schools and worship. In October of 1532, also with the guidance of Mullinger, the Zurich Council issued a mandate introducing a second preaching service on Sunday at 11 a.m., especially for children and servants. During the service, the preacher should explain the Lord's Prayer, the Decalogue, and the Articles of the Faith in a comprehensible way. This mandate was soon followed by the ordinance for preachers and the synod, 
which declared that these traditional catechetical texts should also be recited by the ministers during the main Sunday morning service after the sermon. It also extended the mandatory Kinderpredigten to the rural parishes. The ordinance explains that this should be done to raise the children in discipline and piety and to prevent them from going to the Lord's Supper without understanding. Also from October 1532, it would school ordinance, which stipulated that the students of the two schools should be examined on Saturdays with regard to believing and praying, which I take as a reference to the catechetical parts of Lord's Prayer and Creed. In short, the year 1532 witnessed to an intensification of the Zurich catechetical practice. Church and school were now actively engaged in the religious education of the youth. According to some writers on the subject, this was an innovation introduced under the leadership of Wunninger. However, it remains to be seen that this conclusion is correct. The fourth and final fixed point is the composition of two German catechisms by Zwingli's friend and ally, the Jude. The first German catechism, German catechism appeared in 1534 as a christliche klare und einfache in den Willen und die Dignat Gottes. In his preface, Bullinger explained that such instruction must be given to Christian children because of the eternal covenant of God with Abraham, that is, with all believers. Because children have become God's own in baptism, they should be gravely instructed concerning his will and his grace. Bullinger recommends the work of Jude as a work of clear and pure simplicity. In fact, it was not, as Jude himself admitted in the following year. It was rather long and complicated. And probably for this reason, the Synod ordered Jude in the fall of 1534 to draft a text for a new catechism. The result was a work entitled The Akutsa Catechismus. Since the preface mentions that it was written in reply to a request by the previous Synod, it is likely that the shorter catechism appeared in the first half of 1535. I bother you with these historical details because there is in the literature, even in recent literature, some confusion uh, concerning the dates following the older study by Salomon Hess. The synodal decision is sometimes dated in 1533, a year earlier, and taken to refer to the Gross Catechismus. And because uh, we have no edition of the supposed 1535 uh, first Kürzer Catechismus, uh, reference literature sometimes refers to uh, editions from later on, 1537 or 1538 or even 41. But most likely the first Kürzer Catechismus was from 1535. Okay, now to uh, the tradition in more detail. But before doing that, um, we should ask ourselves if there was anything like a catechetical tradition before 1519. Unfortunately, uh, I have not been able to define, find a description uh, of catechesis in pre-Reformation Zurich. What I did find was that in general there were two major impulses for catechetical instruction at the turn of the 15th and 16th centuries. In the first place, Ever since the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, catechetical instruction was promoted as the proper preparation for Christians to receive absolution in the sacrament of confession. This would then lead to the celebration of the Eucharist. This resulted with varying intensity through different regions and periods in an intensification of catechetical teaching. Ideally, this teaching would take place in the Christian family home by godly house fathers who were to learn their children the context of the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the Hail Mary, the Decalogue. But also it became customary that catechetical sermons were preached, especially during specific period, periods of the liturgical calendar. Because of the growing emphasis in late medieval spirituality and the need for a full and conscientious confession of sins, these catechetical sermons were increasingly devoted to the Decalogue, often associated with the cardinal virtues and the deadly sins. Lee Palmer Rondel uh, has argued that towards the end of the Middle Ages, the Decalogue was even the most important catechetical text. A 
second impulse from the later Middle Ages is related to what Susan Karen Nunn has called the people's desire to know about their faith. <coughs> this longing resulted in the institution of many new preaching positions, but also, I think, in new catechetical practices. Two examples are found in publications from Basel. The first example I found in the famous homiletical handbook, the 1503 Manual de Oratorum by Johann Ulrich Sojan. In section 5 of the set 2, Sojan refers to an insertion from his diocesan synod for preachers to recite to the people following the preachings, in the preaching service following the sermon, the text of the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Ten Commandments, also the central catechetical texts of the Church. This should be done during the preaching services who by then had become very popular in the Swiss and South German area. The season Synod also ordered that parish priests should write these catechetical texts on plagues and attach them to the walls of their churches. The reason, Sojan says, is that no one who does not know the promises of God should be admitted to the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist. To make this more practical, uh, Sir Jean uh, urges priests uh, to give the text to their flock in the vernacular. And he very helpfully recites the full text of Lord's Prayer, Decalogue, uh, and Creed in both German and French. Well, in other words, Sir Jean's 1503 preaching handbook shows that pre Reformation preaching services also contained what we might call a rudimentary form of catechetical instruction. This is very similar to Bullinger's later 1532 uh, ordinance for the worship in Zurich. It might very well be the case that Bullinger did not do it to introduce a new form, but rather codify what was already the practice in Zurich in Swingy's days, or even before. But I couldn't uh, find any traces of it. And it's an interesting suggestion. Also, the production of plagues uh, for the walls provides an uh, interesting material parallel to the wall canonism of 1525. The second example uh, from Basel again, is somewhat later, the prefatory letter by Erasmus on the paraphrases on Matthew. There, the humanist scholar pleads for the composition of a summary of Christian faith and teaching to be propounded annually to the Christian people. Moreover, Erasmus also suggests that sermons should be held for baptized children, in which it will be clearly shown to them what the profession of baptism involves. After these sermons, these children should be examined and guided to a public renewal of their baptismal profession of faith. To the outrage of some of his, of his contemporaries, Erasmus here hints at a personal confession of faith accompanying the traditional sacrament of confirmation. In other words, summarizing, in the early 16th century there were two major impulses for a catechetical practice. The motive of confession, Christians would have to prefer, prepare themselves for worthy confession and participation in the Eucharist. Second, there was the intellectual and existential desire of lay medieval Christians to know about their faith resulting in specific proposals for catechesis to children in preparation of confirmation. Now, from Erasmus's 1522 suggestion in his uh, preface, it's only a small step in ge geography and time to the reformed practice in Zurich. It's high time we turn to Twingy now. The first reference I found in Twingy's works on the topic of catechesis is not in Pro Pacto, but in another 1523 work, the Uslegen und Grund der Schlusslegen. Following his discussion of the Mass in Article 18, he also discusses the meaning and origins of confirmation. So he conjectures that confirmation originated from an ancient church practice, according to which parents would bring their child, when it had come to the age of understanding, to the priest. The priest would have to instruct the child in the meaning of the faith, that would lead to a public profession of the creed by the child, followed by a symbolic function by the bishop. Originally, this would lead to the baptism of children, so he knows, 
and he also admits it was later replaced by infant baptism, yet did, did, this did not diminish the need for instruction of children. Quote, they would have had a great and serious disadvantage when they would not be instructed in the word of God after baptism, like the instruction children once received before baptism. Moreover, Zwingli mentions that he has heard from certain elderly people, apparently somewhere in, in Swiss, that they remember the ancient practice that parish priests would ask confirmants, children also, to recite the Creed and the Lord's Prayer. He is aware that in the not so very distant past, the churches of his native Switzerland did have some form of a catechetical practice associated with confirmation. This exposition of confirmation from 1523 clearly echoes Erasmus's 1522 suggestions on the subject. However, moving beyond the example of the Basel Humanist, the Zurich Church actually seems to have put into practice Erasmus's plea. In commentary on the Schlussregel, Swinney also reveals that in the preceding year, meaning somewhere uh, between 1522 and the middle of 1523, in Zurich a practice was introduced to assemble the youth on a twice yearly rota to instruct them collectively in the word and in the command of God. Quote, there they learn how to behave themselves in relation to God and to another, but also how they can relate to God as to a kind and friendly father, and how they can run to him in all physical and spiritual needs. These catechetical meetings, Zwingli says, were held during the celebration of Easter and spring, and in the late fall. Zwingli concludes that this practice is a return to the original meaning of the Confirmation, in other words, according to the commentary on the Schlussregeln in the first phase of the Zurich Reformation, even before the major revision of the school system, a new form of catechetical instruction was introduced. Unfortunately, I have not found any other references uh, in Zwingli's works or in the standard accounts of the Zurich Reformation. Therefore, I'm not sure if and to what extent it was more than an idea, but uh, it does prove that Zwingli himself was concerned with catechesis. Uh, suggestion sometimes found that before Bullinger, uh, catechesis in uh, Zurich was depending on the personal initiatives of house fathers or parish clergy is unfounded. While Stringley's 1523 remarks on confirmation resemble the second impulse, the desire of Christians to know about their faith, um, the first motive related to confession might also be present in the early Zurich tradition. It's high time to turn to the 1525 Wall Catechism. If we look at this document from the late medieval preoccupation with catechesis instruction in the Decalogue as preparation for confession, it is notable that the layout and contents of the 1525 Zurich document draw the reader's attention first and foremost to the Decalogue. Unfortunately, uh, there was a technical problem. Also with uh, giving you a, a larger picture of the Wall Catechism, um, but perhaps you can read it on the handout a little bit. Um, the title of the document only uh, refers to the Ten Commandments, so it does not say this is a catechism consisting of several elements, but it focuses exclusively on this Sinn die Zehn Gebot, wie sie Gott von Gott so what nur wie sie auf dem Werk Sünder die angeben und mit seinem Finger in zwei steinigen Tafeln geschrieben hat. Further, the emphasis on the decalogue is enhanced by the figurative art, uh, the decorated frames surrounding the two tables. And most conspicuously, there is an appearance of a human head above the decalogue. Uh, it has been suggested that it would, it would be that typical gold, but I think it's Moses with the traditional norms uh, from uh, the interpretation of Exodus 34. Um, no expl further explanation is given for the major focus on the Decalogue. But if we compare it to a similar text from Strasbourg, from roughly the same period, we see that in Strasbourg, uh, the Decalogue was attached to the walls explicitly in preparation for Beicht confession. So, uh, although the Zurich Reformed Church did not ma maintain private confession, uh, the Wall Catechism suggests that the motive from uh, 
confession is still felt in Zurich in 1525. An additional or even alternative explanation for the focus on the Ten Commandments may be found on the Zurich Reformation's rejection of images. As we all know, Zingli was very much concerned to reconstruct Christian worship as a worship in the spirit and in truth, taken from John 4.24. Like Karlstadt before him, he developed a negative stance on the use of images for religious purposes, as we heard early in the morning. In resulting polemics with supporters of traditional Catholicism, the text of the Decalogue became an important battleground in the medieval church, uh, Latin church. The commandments were normally presented in an abbreviated form only following the traditional numbering by Augustine. Uh, following this numbering, the first commandment uh, would include the prohibition of making images, and the prohibition of making images was usually simply left out. It was central, we should not have other gods before other The 1525 Zurich Wall Catechism, however, departs from this medieval tradition, and also from Luther, for instance, by presenting a full the text of the Decalogue in a new translation, um, and what is most conspicuous in this translation is the paraphrastic translation of Exodus 20, verse 5, where the Hebrew text reads, according to the IV, you shall not bow down for images or worship them. The whole Catechism states, du sollst die vor ihnen buchen, ihnen dienen, sie weder ehren noch anbeten. So it's doubled. Instead of two uh, verbs, it uses four verbs. Uh, so full emphasis is given in this Decalogue text on the prohibition of the use of images. It was Ferdinand Kor, uh, beginning of the 20th century, who suggested, I think rightly, that this was a major reason for the production of this wall catechism. On the level of material culture, it replaced traditional objects of devotion by a new, printed symbol of a biblically orientated religion. On the level of theological content, it sought to legitimate the reformers' understanding of worship and the spirit of inner truth by presenting the full text, and even more than full text, of the Decalogue, and especially of the First Commandment. I'll be short now with the last steps. Um, a small excursus uh, will make to Zwingli's uh, 1527 uh, lecture notes, published in 2010, 1527, lecture notes on Exodus. And we will look at two building blocks in his exposition of Exodus 20, which were used in German, uh, Jude's German Catechism of 1535. In uh, Zwingli's exposition of Exodus 20, uh, Zwingli, of course, sharply rebukes the use of images in the worship of the only God. He explicitly reproaches the papist theologians with the fact that, that they usually omit the clear divine command to avoid the use of idols. They subsume this prohibition under the first commandment, but Zwingli argues this is done contrary to the manner of the Hebrews. And still, he goes on, whatever numbering of the commandments is adopted, the prohibition of images is always enforced. It is never allowed to have images because God clearly prohibited it anyway. This is the first building block. The second is found in Zwingli's discussion of Exodus 20, verse 2, the opening formula to the Decalogue, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Zwingli comments that the first and foremost part of the entire law is this promise um, that God is the God who says, I am your God. He is the essence and power of all things. He is the source of all good, the summum bonum. And before giving us his commandments, God shows himself to be the God who deals with us on friendly terms, familiariter gives himself to be enjoyed by us, through Wendel, as we heard earlier today with John Wood. For a further exposition of this gracious dealing of God with his people, Swingley refers back to Genesis 17, 
central text of God's covenant with Abraham and all believers. So we see in the second building block that law is understood in covenant terms, beginning with God's promise. Well, when we look from the 1527 uh, Exodus commentary, it's a small step to use 1535 Kürzer Catechismus. There's a lot of things that could be said about this work, but I will just mention the two building blocks. The most remarkable feature of Jude's German, Second German Catechism is that it opens with a chapter on God and his covenant with us. Jude integrates his treatment of the Decalogue within the covenant framework of this first chapter. His line of argumentation closely resembles that of Swingley's exposition of Exodus 20. God is the infinite source of all good things who has entered into a covenant relationship with Abraham and all his spiritual children. In this covenant, his promise of grace and benevolence, as it is found in the first commandment, has priority. The other commandments are given as a rule for loving obedience as part of the believer's obligations within the covenant. Furthermore, Jude's catechism is also remarkable for its number of the numbering of the Ten Commandments, while Zwingli, Hetzer, and probably also Bullinger up to 1532, still worked with the traditional uh, numbering uh, originating from Augustine. From the 1534 <coughs> First German Catechism onwards, Jude employs the numbering we now know as the typically reformed numbering. Also with First commandment, uh, have no other gods. Second commandment, do not make images. And the, the last part about do not covet as one commandment. <coughs> a numbering which more closely resembles the logic of the Hebrew Bible. This innovation, probably introduced by Yud, was prepared by Sunni's reflections in the commentary on Exodus 20. A few concluding remarks. It is clear that Leo Yud was the main actor in the development of the Zurich catechetical tradition. At least up to the end of the 16th century, this German shorter catechism remained the standard for religious education in Zurich. Nevertheless, there is enough reason to assume that this development started before the 1530s, 1530s and that it was stimulated by Zwingli. If, and to that extent, it was also before 1590-19, we do not know, but it would be very interesting uh, to learn more about that. In 1522 or 23, perhaps even before the arrival of the Lut, some form of collective preparation for confirmation was proposed or even put into practice. Zwingli and Jude together tried to catechize the Zurich population by means of a full and clearly formed version of the Decalogue, in order to lead them to a pure worship of God, unscathed by idolatry, and in the spirit and in the truth. And this brings us back to the heart of Zwingli's Reformation. Thank you for your attention.